It's Sunday morning, and hello. Welcome to CFUN 1410 AM and Experts on Call. I'm your host, Peter Shad, and we're very happy to welcome one of our more popular experts here at CFUN 1410 AM. His resume includes heading up the Faculty of Child Psychology at the University of Ottawa prior to lecturing in psychiatry at Harvard for seven years before moving here to Vancouver, where he's become one of the leaders in the field of biofeedback and neurotherapy, the medical science of adjusting brain waves. He's working on a book, which should be released very soon. We'll talk about that later. And today, we're going to talk about addictions with Dr. Paul Swingle. This is It's All in Your Head, and it's good to see you again, Doctor. Good to see you. Well, this is a huge topic, because when people think of addictions, they think, well, he must be talking about the big drugs like heroin mm-hmm. and uh, crystal meth and all these things, but I mean, we're going to talk about uh, gambling. We're going to talk about even shopping addictions because that uh, could happen. Sexual mm-hmm. addictions. It's a really wide area, and uh, and the, and when you look at people through going through a brain map, uh, you know right away whether they're prone to or perhaps genetically uh, predisposed to those kind of things. Yes, uh, addiction is both a neurological and a psychological state. Uh, the neurological condition, we have genetic predispositions to various addictions, <clears throat> alcohol being the uh, uh, the uh, uh, popular one that we think of, <clears throat> excuse me, in which uh, alcoholism runs in families. Now, it can run in families for genetic reasons, and that's what we see in the brain map. There's a deficiency in an area of the brain that's associated with quieting. And the reason people use alcohol, cannabis, and so forth is to get some relief. Uh, it makes them feel good. It quiets the brain. That's one side. The other side is the social aspect of it. And families <clears throat> where a lot of alcohol is consumed, all social activities are surrounding alcohol, and the alcohol is associated with a good time. The, th- uh, the other <clears throat> behavioral uh, cause of addiction is <clears throat> what we might consider social anxiety. The Probably the uh, popular conception of that is a young person in university and they've been invited to a party and they're feeling anxious about it and they discover if they have a few uh, drinks before they go to the party (coughs) that they feel much more comfortable, more affable and so forth. They can create a condition of uh, alcohol dependence. Now that's not genetic, okay? That's based more on behavioral kinds of such uh, circumstances. Isn't that funny? Because I overheard uh, two young women, uh, they must have been in their early 20s, saying the other day, oh, we've got to go to this place because they have $3 paralyzers and you could just get wasted. <laughs> and I thought, wow, I guess I was like that at one point and we're probably all a little bit guilty of that. But uh, the degree of alcohol abuse and uh, and what they consider binge drinking now is quite uh, uh, quite surprising, actually. And I think a lot of people will be going, hmm, what is the actual, when you consider what is a binge drinker, is it uh, something like prolonged drinking uh, once in five days, or how does it get Well, there are several ways of looking at this. One is you can use a quantity and uh, indicate, let's take alcoholism, for example. A lot of people, f- uh, a lot of the uh, medical professions indicate that <clears throat> if you have two drinks or more a day for a female, uh, that's considered uh, excessive use of alcohol. Uh, if you have, I think the number you cited was if you had five drinks in a row any at, on any particular occasion, that's considered binge drinking. That's one side of the equation. The other is <clears throat> what are the consequences? Now, if you look at the consequences associated with it, you have issues of tolerance. Do you need more and more and more alcohol? Secondly, if you're not having alcohol, do you get grumpy and angry? Okay, so we have a withdrawal issue. Do you have a loss of control? That is, once you get started, you can't stop. Uh, Third, is it implicating any social work or family issue? Does somebody tell you you have a problem, or does somebody avoid you when you're using alcohol, for example? Uh, are you losing other activities? Do you not play tennis because you'd rather be sitting on the sidelines watching somebody play tennis while you're having a few drinks? Uh, and, and you continue to use even though you f- you have noticed that you have some negative effects associated with it. Now, that's a social definition <coughs> of excessive use of some particular substance as opposed to looking at quantity. 
Now, obviously, I think you have to consider both. If you feel that, uh, you know, everything's fine and you're drinking a bottle of scotch a day, <clears throat> then I think we can look at the quantity as being the indicator as opposed to your misperception about the social consequences associated with it. Interesting what you said about uh, there's the genetic predisposition and then there's also the social mm -hmm. aspect. One of the things that I found particularly sad working in Port Alberni was uh, the Aboriginal community, uh, you know, you often get these labels put on people, but because of the abuse in residential schools, mm -hmm. this was then passed down throughout all the generations, and, and they discovered, you know, that this was one of the main cores about that, and they had these ceremonies to absolve themselves of the guilt of that, and I was yes. at one of those, and it was quite amazing. But you could see how the damage can be passed on from, from generation to generation in any kind of uh, cultural group or, or family, for that matter. Childhood sex ab uh, sexual abuse is directly correlated to alcohol and drug abuse. <clears throat> the, uh, there's a lot of uh, research that's been done on that, and the uh, linkage is pretty clear. The other is, you know, if you're referring to various uh, cultural groups, there are differences, genetic differences among these various populations, <clears throat> and it's the, uh, uh, the D3 allele. It's one of the uh, dopamine uh, receptors it differs from uh, one group to another, so that one group is more vulnerable to uh, alcohol abuse <clears throat> as opposed to another. And, uh, you know, we have all the stereotypes associated with that. To some extent, those stereotypes are correct. We're going to talk a lot about uh, not only alcohol abuse, but all sorts of other uh, dependencies. And you are not going to believe what is inside crystal meth, what it's made up of. And we're going to go through that a little bit later on. Mm -hmm. But uh, I was shocked to see. I don't really know a whole lot about it. I just know that it's very popular. It's very cheap. Mm -hmm. And it's bringing you a lot of patients. Is it ever? <clears throat> and, you know, I'll uh, ask you to describe some pictures that I have here All for, right. for our audience a little later on. Before we get any further on the subject matter of alcohol abuse, I always want to welcome uh, your phone calls at 280-C-FUND, 280-2386. That's 280-2386, star 1410 on your cell phone, or if you're calling from outside the Lower Mainland, one eight seven seven two eight zero 280 cfund if you have any questions uh, regarding uh, neurotherapy, which we'll talk about just in a sec here, or uh, the subject matter, which is uh, addictions of any kind, Dr. Swinkle is here live and will happily answer your questions for you and maybe give you some direction. But uh, neurotherapy is a, a word that when you say it to people, their, their eyes kind of glaze over and they go, oh, no, I never heard of that. What's that? Is that some kind of electroshock therapy? And it, it's not. So let's quickly uh, go through what it is exactly you do to treat people with all sorts of different issues. Mm -hmm. uh there are a lot of different treatments that we can use for addiction, <clears throat> everything from neurotherapy, which I'll describe in just a minute, <clears throat> including behavior therapies, uh, uh, residential programs, hypnosis. There are a lot of things that we can do. The number one issue in getting rid of or treating an addiction is the commitment of the person. Have you had enough? And if you've had enough and you say <clears throat> that I'm fully committed to doing what's necessary to get it done, all addictions are treatable. Now, neurotherapy, <clears throat> excuse me, is one of the principal methods for treating a wide range of addictions, uh, alcohol, drugs, gambling, and so forth. And it's based on a very simple principle, and that is all of our behaviors are associated with brain activity. If we have an anomalous behavior, a problematic behavior like an addiction, there is an area in the brain that's associated with that. And if we find that area of inefficiency in brain functioning and can correct it, then the symptoms abate. It's that simple. <clears throat> now, the first thing we do is we do a brain assessment to see what areas of the brain are implicated. Addiction is not a single uh, item. There are many, many different uh, areas in the brain that can contribute to addictive behavior. And what we're looking for are those areas of inefficiency. Once we've found them, then we can correct them with neurotherapy. And there are three general classes in neurotherapy. The first is brainwave biofeedback, which a lot of listeners are probably familiar with. There we set it up so that when the brain is doing what we want it to do, the person will hear a tone or see something move on the screen. If it's a child, we set it up so that they can play a video game with their brain. And it's telling them about a brain activity they couldn't possibly feel. But they make use of the feedback information to learn how to self-regulate. 
The second class of treatments are the brain drivers. Those are the ones that I've been primarily uh, uh, interested in, and my clinic is number one in North America in the development of those. There we measure a particular aspect of brain functioning. Based on that measurement, we stimulate with light, sound, microamperage stimulation, EMF fields, and so forth to nudge the brain into more normative functional ranges. The third class of treatments are home-based. We prescribe things like harmonic sounds and so forth <clears throat> that we know influence the brain in a particular way. We know that because we pre-measure it before we prescribe it. Once the brain gets into normative range, then the symptoms abate. The uh, harmonics disc, I still have it, <laughs> if anyone's wondering. It's, it sounds like white noise. It sounds mm-hmm. like, and if you have it on very quietly, which you're supposed to, just audible, it sounds kind of like the ocean. Yes. And I'm wondering if the ocean has frequencies that it gives off that actually relaxes people and makes them sleep, which is why so many people like going to the ocean. It's interesting. The sleep harmonic, uh, that's probably the one you have. Uh, we dis- I discovered that quite by accident. I was working in my labs at the University of Ottawa working on a sound for a, a breathing exercise, and one of my graduate students walked in uh, to where I was working, he had been in his office about uh, 10 meters away, and he said, I don't know what's the matter, I'm tired. It was about 8.30 in the morning. He said I had a good sleep. (laughs) (laughs) And it turned out what I was working on (coughs) was subliminal in his room. So we prepared that and tested it, and it became a good uh, sleep uh, 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 aid. But interestingly, the waveform that's in that is the same frequency as most of the waveforms in the ocean. Uh-huh. It's so many times per minute, okay? Right. And uh, there was a, a psychiatrist at uh, uh, Harvard Medical School who pointed that out to me, that the frequency of my harmonic is almost identical to the ocean frequency. Interesting. Uh, we're talking with pa- Dr. Paul <coughs> Swingle from Swingle and Associates. So we're talking about neurotherapy and how it can help uh, with addictions of various kinds. Uh, Dr. Swingle's clinic, by the way, is downtown in Coal Harbor on Melville Street. And the uh, telephone number there is 608-0444, 608-0444. And he has a great website with all sorts of resources. Even past shows that we do are archived. Uh, maybe they're pertaining to a particular subject matter you're interested in. It's swingleandassociates.com. That's swingleandassociates.com. S-W-I-N-G-L-E is how you spell Paul's last name. And when we continue here, the ingredients in crystal meth. Unbelievable how many people are doing this. And what it can do is just absolutely shocking. We'll talk about that in just a moment. And why are gamblers so stimulated and uh, how can gambling addiction start we'll talk about that as well and take your phone calls at 280 cfund 280-2386 you're listening to experts on call it's all in your head here on cfund 1410 am and it's great having you along on a sunday morning here on cfund 1410 am i'm your host peter shad along with dr paul swingle from swingle and associates uh, talking about neurotherapy, how it can help you with a wide range of brain-related issues. But uh, specifically today, uh, we're talking about addictions. And one of the more popular drugs of choice, uh, especially among the younger populations, because of its duration, the duration of the high and its cost, is crystal meth or methamphetamine. And uh, I didn't really, you know, you hear about it. We Mm. saw the video of the... uh, the driver who stole the car that became very public and uh, was driving in a rage with his gun, firing his gun off and driving down the street. What makes up crystal meth? Well, you can make it from ingredients that are readily available. <clears throat> For example, it, in, it uh, contains nitrates, phosphorus, lithium, antifreeze, lantern fuel, uh, cigarette lighter fuels, and uh, you blend all that stuff together and, and uh, make a, a crystal uh, out of it. And it can be used in a variety of different ways, as you know, smoked and that sort of thing. But it has a uh, huge, huge negative effect on individuals. We see a, a large number of uh, people who have uh, a crystal meth-induced psychosis and the phrase that's used in the industry is the person has fried their frontal lobes. It can have a horrible, horrible effect. <clears throat> I have some uh, pictures here. Maybe you want to describe what they look like. Okay. The, it's, a be- it's a before and after picture of a, um, a user, and it's within a four-year span. Mm-hmm. 
And, uh, well, I mean, I, I think you should almost put this on your website. The before was from 1998, and the after was 2002. And, it, honestly, this woman, who's actually quite attractive, um, looks like she gained about 60 years. Mm-hmm. And her teeth look like they're about to fall out. Her hair is like straw. Uh, her eyes are completely vacant, and she has abscesses all over her face. Um, unbelievable. And then when you go on to look at this, uh, and this is uh, one of the manuals that you have, uh, you know, the, what it can do to your gums and your teeth is absolutely horrific, the dental problems. But um, there's so many other awful, awful side effects that I had no idea about until I saw <laughs> That pamphlet you had, mm-hmm. and uh, obviously you have, you know, you have these patients coming in. What, what's the most difficult thing about treating a patient with a crystal meth addiction? Commitment. Uh, it's very important that the individual. That <clears throat> very often, the people that come into private clinics with addiction are being brought there by somebody, you know, concerned parents, concerned spouses, family, and so forth. And their behavior <clears throat> has not triggered the legal. Uh, or mental health system. Uh, so what happens very often is they hit some bottom, uh, like the fellow driving firing guns. I mean, he's going to end up in jail and then probably put in a psych ward somewhere so that he will get treatment because he is confined. Now, if you're trying to do it in the private sector, uh, outside of the that confinement, then commitment is a very, very large issue. And we spend a lot of time making sure that the person who has come to our office uh, is fully committed. Now, if that's the case, then there's a lot of things that we can do. The first thing is we change the brain activity so that uh, some of the the, uh, neurological predispositions and triggers for this are normalized. And the second thing is we work with them behaviorally. What are things that they can do? to minimize, <clears throat> excuse me, the cravings and you know, that sort of thing. We always recommend some social support system like uh, Narcotics Anonymous, Alcohol Anonymous, whatever. Uh, and the third thing is they have to make an important change in their living conditions. The statement that I make to an alcoholic <clears throat> is I can't keep you sober on a bar stool. Uh, the meaning of that, obviously, is that you have to change your social network and your friendship network so that <clears throat> you're hanging out with people who are sober, you're doing things in which alcohol is not the central issue. So this woman here that you've given me a picture of, uh, mm-hmm. the, the damage she's done to herself, is it's irreversible from a physical standpoint, but uh, from getting back on the right track, I mean, she could could she become a, a regular member of society again? Because it doesn't look like it from the picture. Yes, absolutely. And there are a lot of things that can be done. Uh, obviously, all of the dental problems that you uh, saw in that picture uh, and requires heavy duty dental work. Obviously. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and as uh, she starts to eat properly and uh, take care of her nutrition and uh, health and so forth, then you know, a lot of recovery is possible. What about, uh, do you ever worry that when you have, you're treating patients like this, that they, they could become violent or have a psychotic episode or, uh, or do they ever, do you ever have patients that come in high and you know? Yes. Uh, the rule of thumb is you do not treat anybody that's obviously, uh, intoxicated. <clears throat> I've made a few exceptions to that. Uh, one is actually in my book, uh, <clears throat> mother called and pleaded with me to see her daughter and she said I think she will arrive drunk because she had been uh, drunk 24 hours a day virtually for you know I don't know half a year or so and she was very close to death by the way so in any event when she arrived she was in fact intoxicated and uh, uh, I worked with her in terms of uh, getting her uh, into a situation in which she could not drink for about 24 hours, and then we were able to do something with the brain. Uh, and you get some uh, very peculiar responses when somebody's high on heroin, for example. Marijuana affects the frontal lobes and so forth. Uh, the number here is 280-C-FUND, 280-2386. We're talking with Dr. Paul Swingle from Swingle & Associates about addictions. If you have a question about addictions and its treatment, 
and uh, what Dr. Swingle can do to help, by all means, we'd love to hear from you at 280-CFUN, 280-2386, star 1410 on your cell phone, or toll-free 1-877-280-CFUN. Uh, I'm wondering about the length of time it takes to treat somebody either with crystal meth addiction or a heroin addiction mm-hmm. uh, compared to, say, somebody with uh, an alcohol problem. Is there a difference, or are they the same? A lot of that depends on chronicity. How long have they been addicted, and what is their, uh, how much are they using? Uh, obviously, the longer they've been uh, addicted and the amount they're using uh, will uh, dictate how long it takes to uh, to treat. Now, I'm talking about the neurological condition. Uh, if you get somebody who's heavily committed, that you know enough is enough is enough, and uh, they go out, let's say an alcoholic, they go out and they go to an AA meeting every day. They form associations in AA so that they have somebody they can call. They do a couple of uh, treatments uh, <clears throat> a week in terms of neurotherapy, and they uh, start to pay attention to their nutrition. They let their physician know that they have an alcohol problem, and if that physician is not familiar with addiction, and most of them are not, that they go to an addiction physician so that they can pay attention to liver enzymes and so forth and so on. Um, we can make a huge difference very rapidly. Now, the, the issue there was the person's commitment. We've got the resources, but if you know if they don't use them, you're not going to get anywhere. 280 Fund 280 Let's talk to Candy. Hi, and thanks for joining us with Dr. Paul Swingle. You're on Fund 1410 AM. Candy? Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I have a kind of a simplistic question, but it's um, is there a, a common sense indicator that could possibly be toned up by your therapy? And that would be in reference to um, what pushes a person kind of over the border of common sense into addiction in the first place. And then the, uh, it, it seems to me like there's a, it's a replacement perhaps um, for a physical or a psychological overwhelming condition. And then, um, you know, that's the reason why they get addicted in the first place. But uh, common sense tells us that the replacement's worse than the overwhelming condition, the original overwhelming condition. So my question, (laughs) kind of around the block, my question is, um, you know, can you, is there an indicator when it comes to common sense, and can you kind of tweak that up somehow? We don't mind around-the-block questions, by the way, Candy. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very interesting question. Uh, we have people who uh, develop addiction because their fundamental condition is panic disorder. Now, the individual uh, uh, goes through panic episodes. They can't leave the house and so forth. They find that if they uh, drink a bit, that either they can get out of the house or it doesn't bother them as much. Now, there are situations in which uh, if there's a deficiency in in one part of the brain, that they make use of alcohol to quiet themselves, okay? Now, what Candy is referring to is a family member can see the damage that's taking place much more so than the person who's addicted. And what can an individual do in that context to try to encourage the person to have a hard look at themselves in terms of what damage that's doing? That's not really a brain issue. That's really a social issue. And you have issues associated with doing interventions, uh, getting individuals to try to get the person to sit down and and actually uh, consider some of these things. But most addicts are in denial. you know, I don't have a problem, you have a problem, <laughs> that kind of thing. And one of the implications in what Candy is saying is that you would have to bring the person in to do something to give them more insight. And if you were able to get them in the door, you've done that job already. Thanks for the call, Candy, at 280-C-FUN, 280-2386, or star 1410 on your cell. And when we continue with Dr. Paul Swingle and our subject of addictions, the truth about marijuana, just a benign drug used by hippies, not anymore, and very damaging as well. Also, we'll talk about gambling addictions and more when we continue with Dr. Paul Swingle on It's All in Your Head. This is Experts on Call on CFUN 1410 AM.
Good to have you along on a Sunday with Dr. Paul Swingle. It's all in your head here on CFUN 1410 AM. I'm your host, Peter Shad, and Dr. Swingle headed up the Faculty of Child Psychology at the University of Ottawa before uh, going into psychiatry at Harvard for seven years before moving to Vancouver, where he's now one of the leaders in the field of biofeedback and neurotherapy, a guru, if you will, and uh, someone who really wants to trumpet the, uh, the benefits of this particular therapy uh, over medication. In fact, some of that medication that's being prescribed to deal with brain-related issues, people become addicted to. We'll talk about that a little bit later on. Now, the wacky tobacco is something that's uh, pretty common in this neck of the woods here in British Columbia. In fact, uh, some people would argue that we have the best in the world. And uh, you hear a lot of people say things like, well, you know, when I smoke marijuana, I feel more creative. Or, um, well, smoking marijuana is not like drinking because you don't ever see uh, uh, a guy who's high on marijuana getting into fights at a bar. They just sit around and smile and laugh a lot. But uh, as you were telling me off the air, and as we're starting to learn a little bit more and more, in fact, there was some research out in the last couple of weeks, uh, the chances of uh, psychotic episodes down the road for people who use it just every week increases by two to three times. Yes. And earlier on, we used to think that marijuana was a benign alternative to alcohol for all the reasons that you just mentioned. The research is quite clear on this. and <clears throat> It is a dangerous drug. Uh, I see a lot of uh, kids in their uh, late teens, early 20s, uh, whose life is just uh, going into a cul-de-sac. And they were chronic uh, marijuana users. Now, what I mean by that is once a week or more. Uh, and the problem is you feel more creative. You have these brilliant ideas, but you have no motivation. So nothing ever happens. You know, you sit around and giggle and, and you know, have these great ideas. Sometimes you actually write them down, uh, but nothing ever happens. The second thing that has become obvious is that <clears throat> marijuana increases the risk of psychotic, ep of psychotic uh, uh, behavior in the short term and it re is related to the development of psychosis, heavy-duty psychosis, and the, uh, it, it increases the risk, risk two or three times, and that's huge. We have a lot of uh, clients that we see with drug-induced psychotic uh, uh, psychosis, and marijuana is high on the list <clears throat> associated with that. The larger the dose, the greater the risk. Now, there's a huge amount, a huge number of the population that uh, are using marijuana at that level. The uh, estimates in the United States and the UK is that 20% of young people, that is defined as under 21, I believe, had used marijuana at least once a week over the last year. That's a huge uh, element of the population. Now, the second thing we're finding is that uh, uh, individuals later in life, there are a lot of older individuals, 50 plus, who are uh, addicted to marijuana. Now, um, some of those are just the uh, you know leftover hippies of the uh, of the 60s, and they've just uh, 60s, and they've just continued the uh, their habit. The other thing that's very peculiar that we find <clears throat> is that there are some parents who are using marijuana with their children as a family recreation. Of all of the, you know, stupid things in this world, that is close to the top of the list. <clears throat> uh, for individuals to feel that they have to develop a special relationship with their child by inducing drug-induced drug psychotic uh, uh, states, you know, clearly you have a parenting problem. When you talk about psychoses, mm -hmm. give me an example of like okay. uh, what a psychotic episode would be like. Well, what are we talking about? Uh, you walk out, start to walk down the street, and feel that everybody's looking at you, and uh, that uh, somebody is following you. Uh, and, you know, there are all kinds of things that uh, qualify as uh, psychotic uh, episodes. Or that you do something and feel that you were not responsible for it. Somebody else made you do it, <clears throat> etc. And anything that is a, a 
distortion of reality is defined as psychotic. I would love to know what percentage of the population uses it every single day because I know people mm-hmm. who uh, are nonstop from the morning or the moment they get up till when mm-hmm. they go to bed at night. Mm-hmm. And I, I would imagine that's a pretty high number. I think you're right. And the uh, I don't have any numbers on, on that level of use. The other thing with uh, older individuals is it has a very substantial uh, health risk. Uh, the the uh, cardiovascular risk goes up substantially with uh, marijuana use later in life, <clears throat> as do uh, pulmonary uh, issues and pneumonias and all kinds of things, uh, seizure behaviors. So when a client comes into your uh, clinic and uh, they're complaining that they're, they're, they're addicted to marijuana or they mm-hmm. want to do something about the marijuana mm-hmm. issue, uh, you, you are, can you already tell when you do a brain assessment that that is their drug of choice? And, and uh, is it an easier drug to treat than, say, heroin or crystal meth? I think it is an easier one to deal with. <clears throat> um, well, certainly uh, relative to crystal meth, yeah. I mean, they're not in the same ballpark at all treatment-wise. Um, Again, the bottom line is uh, an individual who's using marijuana, marijuana nonstop, they get up at 8 in the morning and you know they take their last toad at uh, 12 at night uh, versus a, uh, an alcoholic who uh, uh, binge drinks. You know, every Saturday night he gets, uh, gets drunk uh, versus a crystal meth person who has used crystal meth, uh, say, once a month for the last three or four months, uh, the crystal meth person may be the easy one to deal with, even though it's a much dangerous, more dangerous drug. So <clears throat> there's a dose issue here, uh, a chronicity issue. How long have they been doing it? And then, of course, the commitment issue. 280 Fun is our number, 280-2386, star 1410, if you're driving around on this Sunday morning. And toll-free, 1-877-280-CFUN, 1-877-280-CFUN. We're talking with uh, Dr. Paul Swingle from Swingle and Associates. What he does is he treats people for a variety of issues that relate to the brain with uh, a therapy called neurotherapy. And we'll uh, go over that again in detail shortly. The clinic is on Melville Street in Coal Harbor, and his telephone number is 6080444, 6080444. But if you just want to check his website, there's just a wide variety of great information on there. We have archived programs that uh, we do. And the website address is swingleandassociates.com. That's swingleandassociates.com, S-W-I-N-G-L-E, and associates. But we are here, and Dr. Paul Swingle is live. 280-CFUN is the telephone number. Let's move on to um, gambling addictions. Mm -hmm. Uh, We see casinos popping up more and more. uh, So it's interesting that uh, we're probably seeing more and more people with gambling issues. Uh, What's the difference between a gambling issue and, and a drug issue? Well... Anything can have addictive properties. One of the fundamental things with addiction is you're trying to distract yourself. You know, uh, dealing with life on life's terms is too difficult for you. Uh, anytime you get into some sort of difficulty, uh, you you know you use alcohol so you don't have to feel it, or you can avoid doing something about it. Uh, gambling is a high addiction, and that is. People get into uh, uh, neurological, physiological highs when they gamble. <clears throat> there is a particular area of the brain that lights up uh, when uh, you gamble. <clears throat> and uh, listeners may be familiar with the uh, ad for the restless leg syndrome drug. And one of the side effects that they mention, which may capture the attention of people uh, when they're uh, listening to that ad, is if you have any unusual sex or gambling urges, that's a side effect of the drug and notify your physician immediately. People might wonder, you know, why the specificity associated with that? Well, that's the basis of the gambling and sexual addiction, and it's the limbic system in the brain. The drug, the restless leg drug, affects the dopamine in that limbic system, and that is associated with gambling addiction and sex addiction. Addiction. So we do have a neurological basis for this. You know, we used to moralize about gambling and sex addiction. addiction. There, how can there possibly be a, a neurological issue here? It's a moral issue. <clears throat> 
Well, the fact of the matter is there are some neurological conditions associated with it, and they're, they're treatable. 280-CFUN, 280-2386. In just a moment, we'll take a phone call and uh, talk more about addictions, how they're treated, and neurotherapy in general. It's Dr. Paul Swingle. This is It's All in Your Head. You're listening to Experts on Call on CFUN 1410 AM. We are here to enlighten and inform on Experts on Call here at CFUN 1410 AM, and it's all in your head, starring Dr. Paul Swingle, a neurotherapeutic uh, guru. He won't say that, but I will. Uh, it's 280 CFUN, 280 We've been talking about addictions today, and Tim has a question about uh, the relationship between gambling and sex additions, addictions. Hey, Tim, thanks for waiting. You're on CFUN 1410 AM. Thank you. Um, my question, uh, first of all, I'll just quantify a little bit that I've been in uh, uh, recovery, AA, for um, 13 years. Good for you. Haven't haven't slipped or anything like that. Congratulations. And, but it, it just seems that, um, and I grew up in a, in, in a, a violent, abusive uh, mm-hmm. uh, household, but it seems that since I've sobered up, my gambling and sex addiction has run rampant in my life. And you said that it's treatable. And I've been um, in counseling and so on, on and off my whole life. It doesn't seem to help. I've tried the gambling counseling recently. It doesn't seem to help one, one, one little bit. Yes. Okay. Uh, are you going to, uh, you're going to AA? Yes. Okay. I, 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 I've probably been to, I would say, between seven and 8,000 meetings. So that gives mm-hmm. you a little bit of a... a, a uh, on how my commitment is. Yes, okay. And have you gone to Gamblers Anonymous? No. Okay. It's not in my little town that I live in. Oh, I see. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> what you have, I think, is you have a genetic predisposition to alcoholism. And right. My that, father was an alcoholic. Okay. And not my, my real father. So that's one side of the equation. The other is you come from an abusive uh, situation in which your arousal level as a child was through the roof. Right, uh, you exactly. Were, you were always vigilant. You were always concerned. You were always fearful. <clears throat> and now I you're in a situation. sexualized. Yes. Okay. And now you're in a situation in which you're not drinking and uh, anatomically at least, or at least physiologically, everything's pretty dull. So uh, the uh, gambling and sex is giving you an arousal high. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, I, get, I understand that. Okay. So uh, the way we deal with this neurologically is to uh, have a look at some of the arousal regulation systems in the brain, normalize them, and then uh, do some uh, uh, very specific behavioral stuff uh, with you in terms of, of uh, helping you to... Uh, exercise some control over the gambling and the sex addiction after we have made some uh, changes in brain activity. Just off the top of my head, my guess is that you probably have a deficiency in the back of the brain and also an imbalance in the frontal cortex. That's what we tend to find with folks that come in with your profile. It's eminently treatable. And, and is there, how, do I, how do I treat it then? How do I get treatment for it? Because the, my roots... I've done the best I can. Yes. And it's still, it doesn't even, it's not even a drop in the bucket. Okay. How far away are you from, uh, what large... I'm on Vancouver Island. Oh, Van. Oh, okay. That's not a big deal. Uh, and the, uh, uh, there are folks here on, uh, in Vancouver who can uh, help. We can certainly uh, help you at my clinic and, you know, get you hooked up with some uh, other folks. Here, let me give you the phone number, uh, Tim. At six zero eight zero four forty four, it's six zero eight zero four four four, and uh, really appreciate you sharing uh, your story. There's a lot of people that are just like you out there, but uh, you shared with us, and this would be a dream client actually because he's committed. You could tell if he's been to thousands of AA meetings. This mm-hmm. is what you talk about a committed patient. Yes, uh, you know he he was sober for what do you say eighteen years? Long yeah. time. <clears throat> yeah, wonderful. Uh, and he just hasn't found the uh, the formula yet for using that same commitment for the gambling and sex addiction. And you have a, a lot of patients who come in from Vancouver Island, the interior, oh, and yes. even farther away. People fly in from all over the world. <clears throat> wow. Uh, and the clinic is right downtown, so if you, you were able to take uh, you know the ferry and uh, get in, uh, you could probably do a, could you do a number of treatments in close succession, you know, three or four together or within days of each other? 
That's exactly what we do. If people come in from long distances, they come in less frequently for uh, a number of treatments. If you know, I had just had somebody uh, came in from Ireland the other day, and uh, they stayed here for <clears throat> three weeks of intensive treatment, and they'll probably come back in eight months to uh, just finalize because <clears throat> once it's fixed, it's fixed as long as it's stable, and stability is the big issue. And that's difficult to deal with if somebody lives in Greece, for example. You know, you can't uh, see them on a weekly basis to uh, to get it stabilized. 280-C-FUND, 280-2386, our telephone number, star 1410 on your cell, or as Tim tried, the toll-free number 1877-280-C-FUND. As we check in with Carrie. Thanks for waiting, Carrie. You're on with Dr. Paul Swingle. It's all in your head here on C-FUND, 1410 AM. Thank you. Hi, Dr. Swingle. Hi. Um, I, I will acknowledge that I'm one of your patients, a fairly recent one, and I am seeing some changes in my own uh, undiagnosed 31 and, well, 31-year-old brain injury. <laughs> Oh, okay. uh, frontal lobe, just a mild uh, brain injury, but mm. uh, has affected some of my behavior, perhaps even a uh, former addiction to uh, tobacco. But mm-hmm. my question today is in regards to prevention for children to help, because I'm a parent educator trying to help other parents um, have raise drug-free children, as I lost my own son. Um, m- many people may be aware of that. Um, can you tell me what percentage of the p- patients you've worked with who've had an addiction of any form, whether that's uh, mm. a substance or an activity, um, have had a pre-existing mild traumatic brain injury? Great question. Oh, fantastic question. <clears throat> it's very high. Uh, now, again, when you're looking at clinical populations, you're not looking at the general population. You're only looking at people who walk through the door with a problem. <clears throat> so these numbers are distorted, of course, by that fact. But we have a lot of individuals who come in with mild traumatic brain injury who have some sort of addiction. Now, I think the mechanism is the brain injury affects the frontal lobes. The frontal lobes can affect uh, <clears throat> mood states so that these individuals are more prone to depression, more uh, prone to uh, anxiety conditions, uh, uh, rage, and so forth. And they may be using the uh, alcohol, for example, to self-medicate. So there is a strong relationship there. Great question, Carrie. Uh, Congratulations on uh, getting your situation turned around, and thanks for the phone call. And, uh, you, you know, we talked about kids and how they're just naturally prone to bumping into things and you're finding that, uh, you know, a lot of them actually have more serious bumps than at first thought. I mean, it's just one of those things. You're a kid, you bump into things. And, I mean, anywhere mm-hmm. from, you know, being an, you know, a, a toddler to an adolescent, that's just a fact of life, isn't it? Yes. Uh, we all have, you know, <clears throat> bumped our head, of course. Uh, it is cumulative. It depends on how much. <clears throat> and uh, uh, if, <clears throat> excuse me, it reaches some particular state, then you're going to get behavioral changes. We're going to talk more about uh, addictions. We're going to talk more about neurotherapy and how it works. And also, can you be addicted to shopping? Well, we'll get the answer for you in just a second. <laughs> when we continue with Dr. Paul Swingle, it's all in your head here on Experts on Call and CFUN, 1410 AM. We've been talking about addictions on this edition of It's All in Your Head with Dr. Paul Swingle from Swingle and Associates, the website swingleandassociates.com, a great resource to find out more about what neurotherapy is, does, and how it can help you, and we'll talk about that in just a second. Uh, we just had Carrie on the line that uh, was talking about how uh, she's being treated, one mm-hmm. of your patients. She lost her son tragically to addictions, and now she's helping other parents cope. I didn't ask Carrie. Uh, I forgot to ask her about what the website was where Maybe she can help other parents, and we can mm. pass that along in the air. So, Carrie, if you're listening still, give us a dingle here at 280-C-FUND, 280-2386, and then we'll pass your uh, your resource along because I think it's wonderful work that you do, and we should be uh, sharing that information. 280-C-FUND, 280-2386. Let's talk to Marie on this Sunday morning. Hi, Marie. Thanks for being on on C-FUND, 1410 AM. Uh, good morning. Uh, yes, uh, for a person that did a lot of figure skating and had a lot of bad falls, concussions, and pretty well almost knocked out a couple of times, uh, that gets migraine headaches constantly and nothing helps. Um, is there anything that can be done for that? And they should, should they look further and have proper MRIs or whatever to make sure there's nothing more serious going on there in their brain? Yeah, yes, we treat a lot of uh, migraine, and uh, head injury can, of course, be the precursor to some of these things. 
Um, recurrent migraine is something that uh, you should pay attention to. Uh, and <clears throat> very often, some of the preventative medications don't work very well. Uh, what we do here is have a look to see and if uh, particular areas of the brain have been affected and then uh, correct them with neurotherapy. In terms of MRI, uh, if you have concussion and migraine, I'm surprised your physician hasn't ordered one. Uh, uh, I, also, are you still there? Yes. Uh-huh. Uh, uh, what, what type, uh, could they lead to a precursor like to having a stroke or anything, especially if you did have a you know, bit overweight or high cholesterol or high blood pressure? We've yeah, heard that recently. That's right. There's uh, recent research out that uh, uh, migraines with our, uh, uh, this research was particular to not the pain but the uh, visual aura, uh-huh. and uh, that increased the uh, I shouldn't say increase it was correlated with increased frequency of stroke. Yes. And are migraines something that are sort of uh, passed on like from one generation to another, or like a oh yes, <laughs> absolutely. There is a genetic uh, predisposition. And what it is is a, a lack of a proper uh, vascular regulation. <clears throat> and what's causing the pain is the edema in the arterial wall when it uh, dilates excessively. Uh-huh. Uh, and it's uh, correctable with uh, uh, ne- uh, various forms of biofeedback. You can regularize the vascular system. And uh, there's a neurological procedure that we use as well to... Uh, uh, help to regularize and uh, deal with migraine headaches. Yeah, and so what, what are these types of procedures, the neurological procedures? <clears throat> well, let's talk about that because that's what we wanted to get into, what neurotherapy does and is. Let's talk about how you would treat uh, Marie with, uh, with migraines. Okay. The first thing that we do is have a look at the peripheral biofeedback system, and that is things like muscle tension and uh, peripheral blood flow, the vascular system. Make sure that they are operating normally. Uh, very often we find that we don't have to go to the brain at all. Uh, we find that uh, there's a problem with uh, the way the the uh, arterial system is is uh, is dilating, and if that's the case, then we do peripheral bi- uh, blood flow biofeedback, which is not brain. It's uh, dealing with the peripheral system. Is that where you put uh, the uh, the electrodes on the wrists and, and what, on the hands? On yes. the hands, mm-hmm. okay, and feet. And feet. Uh, Then if uh, that does not fully uh, take care of the problem, then we go to the brain. And there's an area in the brain referred to as the uh, sensory motor cortex. And that area of the brain is a particular brain wave referred to as the sensory motor rhythm. And if we increase that rhythm, it uh, decreases muscle tone. And that, in turn, has a very beneficial effect on migraine headache. That's the procedure that's used in this case. Is there a relationship between uh, circulation, like cold hands and feet, and uh, and and that kind of issue, my, migraine type issue? You issues? bet. Uh, cold hands can be uh, associated with Raynaud's. It can be associated with migraine headache. It can be associated with panic disorder, which is a very interesting relationship. Wow. Okay. Wow. Well, we. We've, we've gone through quite the gamut here. Uh, thanks for the phone call, Marie. I know so many people with migraine headaches, and uh, it's interesting. Uh, my girlfriend gets them, and her grandmother had them all the time, serious ones, but uh, not the with the visual, or the what you mentioned about the, the stroke correlation. Uh, by the way, Carrie called a little bit earlier, and uh, she wanted to pass along this website. We wanted to pass along this website. It's www.2020parenting.com. That's www.2020parenting.com. Uh, if you have children with uh, addiction issues, uh, mm-hmm. she wants to help you and, and share her story as well. www.2020parenting.com. Yes. Uh, the big issue here, I think, is uh, for parents to be really vigilant. Any kind of changes that you see in behavior and mood state in, in kids, uh, if they get started down the road, uh, you know, this will give nightmare a new meaning for you and being vigilant at early stages is extremely important and the notion that you're going to be one of the uh, guys or one of the girls by sharing a joint with your child that gives stupidity new meaning all right let's do a couple of housekeeping issues here Uh, i want to come in i want to have a brain map done Mm -hmm. what does it cost and uh and how long before you can get in these days because i know you're a very popular guy uh our waiting list is six weeks or so, something like that. Uh, in any event, the uh, uh, intake 
uh, brain assessment, uh, the basic intake assessment is $180, and then treatments average about $105 each, uh, depending on the level of treatment that you need. And if you are being seen by one of the psychologists, it's between $140 and $155 per treatment. If you're seen by the uh, technicians, it averages about 100 So if you balance them all together in terms of uh, frequency of seeing a psychologist versus the uh, technician, it averages $105, $110 each. Covered by some extended medical plans? If you have extended medical, most of them carry a mental health uh, benefit, <clears throat> and whatever you get for a registered psychologist is what you'll get back. And what is not covered is a uh, tax-deductible medical expense because we are registered psychologists. And that's really important that you find somebody who is registered, correct? Oh, that's the other issue, yes. You don't want uh, any of the one-size-fits-all. A lot of hobbyists are uh, you know, uh, kind of sprouted up around Vancouver. Uh, they uh, buy a franchise and uh, one size fits all. Uh, you want somebody who's licensed to practice something like medicine or psychology in this province so that if they mess up with your brain, they have something to lose besides uh, shutting their door and going somewhere else. The book will be out when? Well, they guarantee it will be out March, April. March, April. Wow. <laughs> yes. And it's called? <clears throat> Biofeedback for the Brain. And that's for the consumer. That's uh, you right. have another book for practitioners. That's right. Yeah, that's uh, uh, neuro for, neurotherapy for the primary care practitioner. That's for physicians and psychologists who want to add neurotherapy to their, uh, their treatment uh, options. And the clinic? for uh, Swingle and Associates is on Melville Street in Coal Harbor. Dunsmuir becomes Melville, mm -hmm. by the way. And the telephone number is 608-0444, 608-0444. Don't let the waiting list uh, intimidate you, by the way, because often people cancel and so people right. get moved mm -hmm. up. So uh, don't uh, let that uh, scare you away from uh, starting your life. 608-0444. The website is Swingle and associates.com that's swingle and associates.com it's always a pleasure great show today we're Lots not going to be able to deal with your shopping addiction oh i know oh, <laughs> can it be absolutely we can save you a lot oh of money. my goodness because you go into a store and it's like going into a casino the lights are ringing <laughs> things are flashing and then sometimes you have that buyer's remorse. I completely forgot yeah, about that. Yeah, but you just saved $100, right? Because <laughs> <laughs> it was all on sale. Apart from uh, shopping uh, addictions, what's the next subject uh, we'll talk about in September? Okay, September is the start of school, so it's a good time to talk about ADD and learning disorders. Very good. Uh, as always, a pleasure to talk to you, Dr. Swingle. And as we leave you and leave you, uh, your favorite song, What a Wonderful World. Thanks for listening, and uh, so long for now. I see trees of green, red roses too. I see them blue for me and you. And I think to myself, 